You're gonna be good to go. Alright. Can I, can I F I, oh, switch over now? Right. Yep. Awesome. Alright. You guys ready to talk about board games? Yeah? yeah. Board games. Analog, right? Crazy. Uh, I'm Nick. Uh, if you didn't hear the introduction, I've slowly started to get uh, acclimated to the Rock Game Dev community, so thanks, uh, Rob, John, Wes, uh, Pete, everyone, for uh, inviting me and trying to get us involved. Uh, I'll have a, a co-conspirator, Dan Letzring, coming later today. You guys may have met him at uh, the Maker Fair or uh, uh, the Made in Rock Game Fest. So he's another uh, local board game designer and publisher. So yeah, let's get started, right? All right, a little about me. Uh, you can see up front. Uh, if you want to get up and take a look, feel free. I'm hoping for kind of like a interactive presentation, not just me. Yeah, I'm bringing it at you for an hour, however long this goes. Um, but you can see the board games uh, that I've worked on, Hero Brigade and Eternal Dynasty. Uh, they were actually uh, co-published and distributed by GameSlute. So they actually saw some national distribution that way. So uh, you can check them out on Amazon. Eternal Dynasty actually sold out, so probably have to pay <laughs> uh, on eBay for that. But uh, um, yeah, uh, I've been doing this for about five years now, right? My wife is here in attendance, so. She's my fact checker, so, <laughs> so I, think, I think about five years. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll introduce you to Dan, too. He's a lot more prolific than I am. He does publishing of other people's games, too. Uh, so he's done six successful Kickstarters, uh, and uh, he's probably running a little bit late, uh, but he'll be here to answer questions as well. But um, he got really offended when I put five successful Kickstarters in here. <laughs> he was like, no, it's six. So he's going to be a great guy to talk about uh, crowdfunding and also if you have a physical product how to get that into distribution and uh, like actual onto game game store shelves which I assume is the goal if you want to design a board game so you can check them out Ledman games I'll throw this up on the Facebook group too so you can uh, download it and look through it at your leisure later so same thing with video game development you need to play a lot of games like you have to be a student obviously you guys are students uh, or a lot of you are at the magic school, so you be a student of the genre, just understand games in general, and you should design for yourself when you're first getting started in board game design. Don't make what you think is going to sell, like don't make the flappy board, flappy bird of video games, uh, you know, board games. Like don't do that. Just don't cash in. Make something that you want to play, that you and your friends want to play. Uh, you know what works in the games that you like, what doesn't work in the games you like, and what audience are you making that game for? Uh, with very few exceptions, uh, you can't copyright game mechanics, so don't be afraid of stepping on uh, existing mechanics. The one that's actually patented is tapping from Magic the Gathering, but you can get around that by calling it like exhausting, using, disabling, or, or what have you. So don't be afraid to reuse mechanics that are out there. Um, that's how a lot of game design in general, just video games too, it's iterative, right? You build on what's come before. I mean, occasionally you're going to have that lightning bolt idea that results in, like, Battle Royale, right? That, okay, everybody catches, catches in on that afterwards. But normally you're going to build on something that's come before, something that you've liked. Why, why was Magic Game the copyright? Uh, lawyers. <laughs> like, Wizards of, Coast, uh, Wizards of the Coast lawyers. But, yeah, it, it's one of the rare exceptions, and people in the bargaining committee hate the fact that that's patented because nothing else is, right? No other game mechanics are, are in the board game space are, are patented. So, yeah, you know, if you're going to make a deck building game, that's one of my favorite genres, you know, what's going to set your game apart? Uh, here's some ex example of themes and mechanics. Normally when you're coming up with a game, you have your idea, right? You're going to make your, you know, pirate voting drafting game, right? It actually sounds kind of cool. But uh, if you just, I mean, these are all just random examples. You can go on Board Game Geek or any other board game resource just to kind of brainstorm. And you'll see all the different mechanics and themes at play. So don't get married to anything because you'll never know when you come up with a mechanic, your game engine says, okay, you know what? Zombies didn't really work. This is better as a train game. Or, you know, you try to slap on a theme, uh, mechanics to a theme and you're like, that, that doesn't work either. So maybe we change the mechanics. So uh, don't get married to game design. And for board games, it's actually easy to start with a theme. Uh, that's probably a little bit different from what you guys do in the video game world, where you start coding your engine, like you start laying out your variables and your design doc. 
that kind of thing. So normally in the board game space, you actually start with the theme first. So you're like, I want to make a deck building zombie game. So ideally, they go, they go hand in hand. So there's a few examples of you know things you'd pair together. Um, far future space colonies, like a 4x game, 5x game, that would be trading and exploration. Be, those would be your mechanics. Any questions so far? All right, we're going to keep going. We're going to plow forward. You to expect a lot of questions at the end. So, next question is after you've decided on your theme and mechanics, how heavy is your game? Like, what's what's the weight? And you know, that's not just physical weight, but how cumbersome is it to learn? How tough is it to learn? You have your uh, how many guys are you like pretty pretty heavy board gamers? Okay, what are some of your favorite like quick games like that you can play in like twenty minutes or less? Love letter. That's a good one. Yeah. So she go. Yep. Yep. Okay, so yeah, those are the uh, those are what we call light, lightweight games. That's something like if you're having a game night, you're gonna start with that game or close with, with a lightweight game just to you know, kind of cleanse the palate. So you know, these are easy to learn, quick to play, probably not too many com components. You know, King of Tokyo, Flex, Navi, uh, Love Letter, those games that you mentioned, very quick, very easy, and uh, but that's probably you're not gonna just play that game the entire time. Middle eight, these are your uh, kind of like in between games. Settlers of Catan, that's like the gateway game, right? When you're trying to get someone <laughs> into the hobby, you teach them Settlers first. And then, okay, you can go on from there. But other games in that Lords of Waterdeep, which I think is like your go-to uh, introduction for worker placement games, these are the what I would consider middleweight. So it's not too tough. You can play about an hour, maybe an hour and a half, and you know it comes in like a decent medium-sized box. Uh, finally, you have your heavyweight games. These are the ones where you just spend an hour just like punching out the components. Uh, like, you know, you have like 10 punch boards, like a bunch of minis, uh, like five folding boards. Uh, you got uh, axes and allies. Anyone play that? Like, yeah, you have to take, like, that's your spring break, right? <laughs> it's like one game of axes and allies. Uh, so Scythe is a big one that just came out recently. I see some heads nodding, yeah. Um, Twilight Imperium is another one. Also some like, yeah, okay. So, yeah, these these are the games that, that's, that's your game night. You might play a lightweight game before. Uh, but you have to plan. You have to, like, Twilight Imperium. What's, what's the fastest game of Twilight Imperium you've ever played? Nine hours. Nine hours, yeah. <laughs> okay, so you, you, you're, you're a terrible person. No. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I mean, those are the type of games. You, like, that's your day. Like, you're, you're, that, that's what you set aside to do. Like, if you want to do two games of that, you know, come up with another plan. So, as I touched on earlier, um, board game design is iterative. The advantage of board game, a physical board game over uh, video games, is how quickly you can prototype. As soon as you have that idea, like you don't need, you just need a piece of paper. Like you can, you know, cut that piece of paper up into a bunch of cards. You don't even need like note cards or index cards. Um, don't worry about the quality of the components when you're prototyping. Just get something that you can play, uh, something that can translate your idea, and you can just actually see how how it goes. Because usually within five minutes of doing that you'll know if this idea is worth developing. Uh, uh, like a video game, like unless you're making a very simple platformer or something that you can just turn out with an, with an existing engine, like you may be like five hours in before you're like, oh, this is garbage. Like, I don't even know what I was thinking. So uh, board game space, you can actually do that very quickly. And uh, have you guys, has anyone heard of paper prototyping? Yeah, so this is actually something you can do for your video game too. Uh, you know, we had Telltale games when I was a kid. Uh, you know, I had to sully my hands with like dirty analog paper, but it was a choose your own adventure book. Uh, like we had that. Uh, uh, the tactics games that you guys grow up on, like Fire Emblem. Like I'm talking to you like I'm old because I am. I just turned 40 this year. So, <laughs> uh, but Fire Emblem, Final Fantasy Tactics, that came out of like Warhammer and 40k, right? So there were like old people like me playing those games in our, our parents' basements, uh, and so you kind of see how that. Evolves like board games influence video games, which go back and influence board games again. So it, it's kind of interesting, and uh, that's why hopefully some of the, some of these design ideas are going to apply to you guys too. So don't be afraid to just rapidly prototype, and as soon as something's wrong, scribble it out, write in whatever change you do, and then and just keep going. So. <laughs> yeah, at, at that point you kind of do. Um, I mean, if you're some people are good at Pictionary, like the, like if you're a quick doodler, it helps to have like even it's like a little squiggle, like a little zombie squiggle, or you know, 
just, just to get the idea across, that, that helps convey the theme. Um, otherwise, you will need a very particular kind of tester who's able to see beyond that and understand what you're, what you're aiming for. But that's, that's a great question. Yep, so fail quickly. I'm sure you guys have heard that uh, quite a lot, too. I'm sorry, did, did you have a question? I saw a hand. Oh, sorry. All right. So yeah, uh, keep iterating, fail quickly. And also, your design should be fluid. You should be ready to abandon ideas very quickly and move on to the next or just adapt what you have. So, leading into playtesting, uh, you're the first playtester. Uh, same with your video game. In some ways, your opinion is the most important, but you also have to, at some point, cut yourself off. Uh, in board game testing, you usually see three different phases. Self, which is just you playing around with your prototype, seeing what works. And then you get to a point where, okay, I can show this to someone else. Or I need someone else's input because um, it's hard to cut off that part of your brain when you're playing against yourself. Like, what's the best move? How would this actually go? Uh, like, you have that information. It's hard for your brain to say, no, I, I don't actually know what that what, what I would do as that player. So you need to bring in your friends. If you have good friends who are willing to play test with you, cherish that friend. A lot of people don't like to play test. You know, as well point out, maybe like the, there's no theme that's really apparent. You know, the art's terrible. It's all, all, all clip art. So uh, you need to find willing participants and also people who are not afraid to hurt your feelings because sometimes you're going to have a bad idea and people's like, oh, yeah, it's fine, you know, just kind of that lukewarm reaction. Uh, so you need to find people who are willing to be critical, but not also just critical for the point of being uh, critical. Some people are interested more in the brutality than the honesty, right? So it, it's, a, it's a tough mix to find. But once you find the right group of people, so, uh, some people whose opinion that you trust, that's going to be your go-to playtest group. Finally, after you go through you know, a couple rounds of that, you're going to do uh, your, your public playtest. And that can be done in a couple different ways. Uh, number one, you sit down with a group of people, and you explain the game to them, and you watch them play. And they know that you're the creator. The other side of that is what's called the blind playtest, where you just give them the box and the rules, and you watch them try to figure it out. So that way you can actually figure out also you know, how are your rule writing skills and from experience, I can tell you, your rule writing skills are probably terrible. Uh, like video games, like you can kind of figure it out, right? You just need like a sandbox and let the guy play around for five minutes and they can figure out the controls. But you can't do that in a board game. Um, along that lines, uh, mm -hmm. when you do blind playtests, you ever find that um, people misinterpret misinterpretation of the rules leads to new... Yeah, it, sometimes you're like, oh yeah, I totally thought of that. That, that was the way. Yeah, right? No, but yeah, so, sometimes people will have great ideas. Uh, the problem with blind playtests, though, sometimes people also have terrible ideas, and your challenge as the designer is to, is to sift through those. But yeah, a lot of times people will misinterpret or have uh, their own suggestions about, you know, what, what about this? And sometimes you'll, you'll have some real gems in there. Yeah. Oh. When you're evaluating your idea, there are a few key questions. Uh, number one, is it fun? Uh, there are some games, like Dwarf Fortress, like, I can't get into Dwarf Fortress at all. Is there, are there any Dwarf Fortress fans? Okay. <laughs> right? So it, it's, yeah. But are you guys familiar with Dwarf Fortress, though? Yeah, it, it's basically just a numbers game. Like, like you're playing with an Excel spreadsheet, which I kind of like, but also it, it's, it's so deep that it's not going to be fun for everyone. And it's okay if you want to design that game. Just understand that that's the niche market you're pursuing, right? Uh, is it interesting? Uh, some things are fun, but not necessarily interesting. Uh, you know, Candyland, like, I guess that's fun. You're playing with your kids, but you're not making impactful decisions, right? You roll the die, you move that many spaces. Roll and move is like the bane of board game design, uh, if you haven't heard that before. So, uh, my challenge, my secret challenge is to make a really good roll and move game, but, uh, it's so random. Uh, you want to make sure that, uh, uh, everyone feels like they have a chance, right? They're making interesting choices as the game develops. Uh, and that brings up the luck versus skill debate. That's a big one in the, in the world of board games, is trying to find that perfect balance between fun and, and interesting. Uh, you'll find uh, there's a genre called uh, Euro games. Uh, are you guys familiar with that genre? Okay. Euro games are, uh, you'll see a lot of worker placement, a lot of trading games, where it's heavily skill-based. There's not nearly as much luck. Uh, I designed what's called Ameritrash. Uh, which is American style where maybe a little more dice, some more randomness with cards, 
that kind of thing. For, for me, like that, that's more that's my balance of, of fun and interesting. Like I still want you to be able to make interesting decisions, but I don't want it to play to exactly the same way. And a lot with a lot of those Euro games, once you develop certain strategies, like Stone Age, Puerto Rico, like you can play a few turns and you can honestly kind of see how the game's gonna go because that's the optimal strategy and you should always do that. <laughs> Finally, is it unique? Um, you know, we touched upon that earlier. What, what's going to set your game apart if you make a deck building game? Um, it's, I mean, are you really just making uh, Settlers of Catan? And it's okay if you are. Um, video game world is especially notorious for this. But there are even some examples in the board game world, too, where um, Tanto Core is basically Dominion, but it has, like, like uh, made waifus from Japan. So it's it's just like a, it's a reskinned uh, re uh, Dominion, so... Uh, it, it happens in the board game world too. That's probably the most infamous example uh, where someone just lifted a game and, and plopped on a different theme. But I mean, how many different Flappy Birds were there after that guy big, right? There's Flappy Bird with like Hulk Hogan, Flappy Bird with like Macho Man Savage. So I mean, like uh, you'll see that too. And, and also some some examples like 2048 and Threes where the um, the clone is actually more successful than the original. So. Uh, we don't see that as much in the board game world because it's so much longer to go to production, right? You're gonna a lot of board games uh, that your development cycle is one one to two years, and then you go to print, which is another you know six months or more. So it's not very for a, even for a simple game, you can't just rip it off and, and get a copy out there right away. Sometimes your idea is gonna be bad. That's okay too. Um, it, it's important to recognize what's worth saving. With a failed design, sometimes, and again, this will apply to your, your video game ideas too, sometimes you set it aside and come back later and inspiration will strike. Uh, the risk to that approach is that you never go back to that idea, right? You come up with something else. And uh, I'm guilty of this, and I'm sure a lot of you guys are too, where you're just jumping from like 75% completed project to 75% completed project without seeing one all the way through. And in board game design, you have to see it all the way through because otherwise you just have a bunch of index cards, right? <laughs> and that's that's not something you can sell on the game shelf. Um, so that you know, one thing is you know, wait, wait until inspiration spikes, go back. And again, sometimes when you're working on something else, you're like, oh, that would be great for my first game, and then you go back and finish it. But um, with board game designs, if, if you think that your, your core idea is good, take it apart, find out what doesn't work. You know, is one mechanic too punishing? Are you not allowing players to feel, you know, catch up? Again, look for that balance between fun and, and interesting. What's what's not working about the game? Is it not fun enough? Is it not interesting enough? Or is it just not unique? All right. Before we jump into this, because this is a pretty big uh, subject, is uh, printing and publishing. Do you guys have any questions about design philosophy for board games? Uh, that's a great question. I usually mean luck. Uh, that's the luck versus skill debate. Um, it can be challenging, but it doesn't have to be hard. Because what happens with board games that doesn't necessarily matter in video games as much is analysis paralysis. Like if you're playing a single player game, it doesn't matter how long you take on your turns. But uh, if you're playing a board game and there's five of you on there and everyone's taking a half hour turn, like that, that's not fun for anybody. So that no, that, that's a very good question. That, and so it, it, yes, that's absolutely part of it. Do you have like For me, I use uh, a lot of Trello, uh, like cart. Like I don't know if you guys do, use a lot of project management uh, type software, but any kind of project man management experience you guys have uh, is so vital to board game design, especially if you're going to uh, publish it yourself, because that means you're the one hiring the artists, you're the one finding a graphic designer. Uh, you're the one finding a rules editor, looking for uh, printers, and you know, it's all it's all you. Do you guys uh, is, do you guys have like a business class or a project management class as part of the curriculum here? No, uh, good question. What's that? So maybe a suggestion. Uh, is that, <laughs> uh, I I didn't do it until uh, I came out to the real world. Like I have ten years of management experience, which really helped a lot when I'm like you know I'm gonna make a I'm gonna make a card game. So. Uh, for for someone who's just like fresh and not familiar with that environment, it can be very daunting. It's like, how do you? Where do you even start, right? Um, you know, looking for artists. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, kind of off of that, you said you mentioned Trello. Mm -hmm. um, is that something that you 
there's an like you have an you had a seventy five percent projects that you don't want to go back to. Mm -hmm. What exactly is the kind of thing that you would save? Because I know like in video games you can have a code snippet that like this right. is just tapping out something I really like. Yep. But you just can't really have you have to have gigs and well, gigs of images it, it, or. Uh, it, it, I wouldn't actually if if I'm only at seventy percent, I wouldn't even commission art at that point. Oh, um, but there are things you can let uh, you can take like uh, if there's a specific mechanic that you think really work worked well for that, like um, a deck building aspect or a movement mechanic, that's something you could transplant to another game. You're like you know what that worked really well in my other game, let's let's use that here too because uh, you know deck depletion would be would be great here too as a resource management type of thing. So yeah, it, it'd be more mechanics that you transplant. And obviously, yeah, if you kind of uh, jumped the gun a little bit and ordered assets, you know, and you know, hired an artist and you never finished the game, then yeah, sure, you can uh, repurpose that for, for another game. But just be careful when, you know, uh, people call that tacked on theme in board game world, where, you know, the mechanics and the theme don't necessarily match, where it, the game could honestly be about, be about anything. Good questions. All right. So, self publishing. I kind of did this. Um, so hoping, I think Dan might be lost. So this is a huge campus, guys, <laughs> especially at night <laughs> when I drove around. Like I've been, I've I've been here before and I still got lost again today. So this is stream. So my the world will know my shame. Um, my wife is laughing because because we actually had to stop and ask somebody. He's like, is that the magic school? Nobody knows what the magic school is. I'm like, is that the video game school? And they're like, yeah. So nobody knows what the magic school is apparently. But call it the video game school, and they know. Uh, Self-publishing is a lot of work, and again, that that's where project management experience would come in useful. Uh, in fact, I, I, I put it in there in the second as the second bullet because again, you're ultimately responsible for everything. Um, have any of you guys worked as freelancers for projects? Yeah. So this is the other side of the coin. Uh, you're not going to uh, Upwork or freelancer as a worker, you're, you're going to fi find people that you need. So the more that you can do, the better. But you also have to be really honest to yourself. Like, how good of a graphic designer am I really? Like, I can do like an okay job, but people are gonna look at those cards and be like, this layout is terrible. Like, there's so much negative space, right? So you have to be honest with yourself. Like, how much can you really do? How much is it worth saving the time and effort to to find the person who will actually do a great job? And again, that's where your, uh, you know, how heavy is the game? What's your target audience? Like, do you want to sell a million copies, or do you just want to make something quick and fun and, and casual, right? If if that's your goal, sure, be your own graphic designer. Uh, but if you really want, if you want to um, find something, uh, if you want to have like a thirty thousand dollar Kickstarter or better, then you're gonna to have to find a good artist and a good graphic designer. Uh, you know, there's all these negatives, but on the plus side, you control your own destiny and you get all the profits. So. It's, it's 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 tough, and that but that's where Kickstarter comes in, and that could be a whole another presentation by itself. But I'll happily answer any questions you guys have on Kickstarter because I've I've done three board game Kickstarters now, so three for three. So um, it's it, it's it's a it's a, it's a tough world to jump into, but uh, I'm around too. I, I put my Twitter and my website on the presentation. Feel free to hit me up if you guys have any questions about crowdfunding. So I did a lot of research, uh, and I, there's some links at the end of this presentation in the appendix. Uh, so you guys can kind of read up too on on how and anything that you learn from those sites is also going to apply to a video game Kickstarter too. Um, the way to save yourself from that headache is to pitch it to a publisher. You don't need a commission art, graphic design. You just need to get it to a point where it's playable, where someone can understand what you're going for, and then you pitch it to them. So you guys may have your favorite uh, publishers like Mayfair Games. They do sellers, although I think they just sold. Like Asmodee is like the, the Disney of board games. Like they're buying everybody up. So, but find a company that you like, uh, whose cat catalog kind of matches the game that you're trying to design, and that's the person that you should try to pitch to, uh, because it's already going to be a fit for you. Already know it's going to be a fit for their library. Uh, <clears throat> you know, if, uh, company that sells kids games, like they're not going to want your your miniature like minis game. So just just know your audience in terms of who you're pitching to, uh, and also. Uh, as someone who's also tentatively looked at other people's designs, uh, people will send you everything. And there's nothing that turned me off faster as a potential publisher as someone who clearly didn't understand like the kind of games that I made, and they were just like, hey, do you want to publish this? And I'm like, not really. So, not to be mean. But 
Uh, as a publisher, you have to do that too. You have to make those tough decisions. Uh, have you guys been to Gen Con, Origins, any board game convention? No? no. What's that? PAX Unplugged, yes. That's, that's, that's new, but it's huge now. It's like just as big as Gen Con almost. Uh, Gen Con's kind of like the mecca of board game conventions. That's the one in Indianapolis, if you're not familiar with it. Um, but that's actually the best place. Those conventions are the best place to meet publishers. Uh, because they're there already. Uh, Toy Fair, uh, that kind of thing. Just email them and say, hey, can I get 30 minutes of your time? You want to prepare two different parts for that. One is your elevator pitch. Same thing as a video game pitch. Do you guys have a pitch? Pitch part? Pitch part? No? Yeah, okay. So, yeah, you five minutes or less. Tell me everything about your game. And board games have something called a sell sheet, which is a, a, a quick summary of what your game is, picture potential components, that kind of thing. So when you give it to publishers, they have some idea of what to expect uh, out of your game. And then if they like it, or if you've already set it up, uh, you know, you'll probably go and pick a spot on the convention floor or you know, wherever they have their headquarters for the convention, and you'll actually demo it to them for an hour or two. So that's, that's your chance to sell your game. So any sales skills you guys have are everything important there. Too. Generally, you're not going to. Um, if you're just hundred, if you're a hundred percent designer and they're a hundred percent publisher, they're going to make all those decisions. They're going to pick art. They're going to pick uh, whatever uh, graphic design, and they may even change a different theme. Dan had a game that came to him as a cowboy western game. He's like, eh. <laughs> and it turned into a game about fairies. So it was, and it, it actually it really worked. Like it was like dark fae. Uh, it's called Groves. Uh, See if I have the art for that. But yeah, see that tree? That that's gross. That that was a Western game. I played like a year of playtesting it as a Western game, and then he's like, it's not so much there. So I'm like, what? <laughs> but actually, it really works because uh, the map, it's a like Catan, you build your map. Uh, it's a modular map, and it's actually a, a tree at the top, and the roots grow out. So I'm like, oh okay, yeah, yeah. Instead of a frontier town, it's a it's a tree. So, uh, the publisher's going to make all this decisions. Yep. Um, what if you have uh, like a team that's building the game, mm -hmm. it, it depends. Um, like, let's say you have an artist on that team, you have to be prepared for the publisher to say, I don't like this art, and we're going to go in a different direction. And then your team's going to have to deal with, okay, you know, what do we do, what do, we do with artists at this point? So, that, that is a risk if you're pitching to a publisher. Good question. Uh, there are also uh, things called prototype alleys and photospiel. Photospiel is a very specific board game convention where everyone in attendance is either a publisher or another designer. And uh, you all just go and play each other's games and offer feedback. So that's a really cool uh, way to see how designers view your games. Uh, and they're all going to pretty much fall into the excellent playtester category. Like they're going to offer good feedback. Uh, Porter Spiel's all over the place. Uh, the next one's in Atlanta in May, or first week of May, but they're all over. Uh, Dan and I have kind of been hoping to start one off in Rochester, too, because I think there's enough uh, community here. Uh, if you guys are interested in expanding your board game time in Rochester, too, there's also a pretty big meetup group. It has, like, 200 members, if you guys have ever been. They used to meet at uh, Uno Pizzeria, uh, but there's, like, 200 people there, so it's easy to find uh, board game. And obviously, uh, I invited uh, Travis. He's the owner at Millennium Games. You guys familiar with Millennium? Yeah. Uh, he couldn't make it because he was too busy tonight, but he's actually a really good resource. Uh, so I'll probably hit you up with his info, so he'll be interested in... in... Do you, like, host your own playtests? Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's where it helps to get to know the owners. Travis actually, uh, when Eternal Dynasty launched, uh, that was my territory control game set in China, uh, he actually had a day where he was like, hey, come meet the designer and, and play it. So that was really invaluable. So that's where it helps to have local connections, too. Yep, great question. Yeah, Travis, yeah. Yeah, Travis is probably the most connected guy. Like, I went to Gen Con, and he, it was like a king holding court, right? There was like 30 people. Like, it was like a gaggle. And he's like shaking hands, doing like the royal way. So yeah, no, he's a good, good, he's a good guy. I think that's it. Any other questions about p pitching? They're talking to a publisher? There's a lot. So, when you're pitching it to a publisher, it should be outside of art, graphic design, and things like that. It should be 100% complete. So, like, it's a paper prototype of a pitch. Yes. 
Yes, yeah. Uh, and that's where it might, it might be different from a video game, too, where a uh, publisher will, will take it, and they're like, okay, I see where you're, the direction you're going with. Like, the New York State Game, game uh, Dev Challenge is not a full game. It's enough to, to get an idea of where the game's going. Because uh, the design life cycle of a board game is is pretty fast. Like, as soon, like you know, when you do a video game and you do a design doc, if you have a design doc that you're happy with, that's your board game design, right? The rest of it is just, you know, writing down the cards and putting out the pieces. So, but the production life cycle, if, you, if you're if you not uh, finding the printer yourself, like, that's that's very short. Because you, uh, in the case of the publisher, you hand it off to them, here you go. And, and a lot of times, they may even make changes to the design without consulting you. Um, but you have that same to, thing, too, if you sell your video game to a publisher. They make changes to it. I mean, most of them are good, and they'll they'll work with you and say, hey, what do you feel about this? Uh, but some of them will just say, okay, we bought your idea for X amount of dollars and X percentage. Now it's ours. And when you're starting off, it's still a percentage. probably going to be like 5 or 10%. So don't don't expect to be get rich off of board games. So. Unless you're like the Jamie Stegmaier, the size, like uh, you can sell. Your Kickstarters are good for at least a million every time. So... I mean, I'm not saying you guys can't do it, but just you know, have realistic goals to start off. Anything else on that? And keep going. All right. Printing and manufacturing. Um, list out your components. That's just, you know, I have 90 cards, uh, and I'm going to need four punch boards, one game mat, you know, five bags, that kind of thing. Uh, that's going to be part of your sell sheet when you pre uh, present it to the publisher. And also, you're going to need to know this if you're self-publishing, because then you're going to have to contact printers and get quotes. And they're going to need to know exactly uh, what's going to be included and in what size. Uh, some components are a lot more expensive than others. Card games are the, by far the cheapest thing to to print. So that's why you see a lot of card games selling for like 5 10 bucks, And anything that has minis is minimum, like 60 bucks, probably 100 or more. Uh, because just the um, one mold for a... I think it's six minis is uh, can be uh, anywhere from five to ten thousand dollars just setting up the mold. So that's why when you see a cool mini or not, and they do like those huge kickstarters. Uh, Kingdom Monster Death did like a two million dollar kickstarter. That's why they have these crazy goals though, because if you're going to print in any kind of scale, you need to sell a lot because uh, the more minis you have, like for each five or six, you know, if you're paying five thousand, ten thousand, that's going to add up very quickly. Uh, reach out um, anytime you're buying something. You know, reach out to a lot of different companies. Same things when you're buying a car. Don't just take sticker price. I mean, you can, but then you're kind of a sucker. So you know, don't don't be afraid to haggle too, right? Uh, get, get the best quote, and also you have to balance quality between uh, quality and uh, price. Some printers like Panda GM, they're the what's considered the gold standard in board game printing. They're a little more expensive, and they also won't print any less than twenty thousand copies. And if it's your first Kickstarter and you're just doing a very small goal, you know, very likely you're going to do like a $5,000 goal and maybe print 1,000 copies. So you probably won't start off with Panda Jam. Um, economy of scale is a really big part. Uh, I included some figures from Hero Brigade, uh, which was mostly cards and one, one chipboard. It was $10 per copy at 500 copies, so $5,000 total. But it was half that price at 5000 So uh, I actually set my goal at 15000 and I was prepared to kind of... Uh, Take the hit if we didn't hit the goal. Thankfully, we hit the goal. So my wife didn't get mad at me. Uh, so I didn't have to pay anything out of my own pocket. Uh, but that, that's that's the risk that you take. Um, some people will only set their goal at the break-even point, which makes sense. That's the safe thing to do financially. But a lot of times it's easier to set a lower goal, and then you set stretch goals or whatever uh, other magnums. And people love – people. everybody loves a winner, right? Once that campaign is funded, you're actually going to see another surge of – the funding too, so yeah. Has um, 3D printing changed? Uh, not too much because it's still so expensive and the quality isn't the same as like an injection molded mini. Because that's where it would make the most sense. Uh, it has affected custom dice a little. Custom dice have gotten cheaper, uh, but as far as minis are concerned, it hasn't made an impact yet. I mean, I think we're close. Like if you go to Shapeways, you can print out a pretty cool mini, but uh, you're not going to get that same. Same price when you're for printing a thousand. Like that mold to set up the design is a lot 
you know, that five minis. But once you have that mold set up, they can print, you know, a thousand of those five different minis for, for, for next to nothing. Great question. Yep. Uh, uh, so are there, like, certain kinds of pieces that you are better off going high quality or get skimping on and maybe make it a card instead of a mini? Like, like, yeah, like uh, yeah I mean, you can have the stand-ups like, instead of a mini. Uh, and I would actually, and that's why you actually get multiple quotes, even from the same printer. You're like, okay, um, you know, the, we're gonna have 50 characters, right? What's the price if these 50 characters are stand-ups, like on a on, on a punch board with little stands, versus the price of what's those 50 are minis? And then you can set a stretch goal, right? You're like, okay, this, they're the stand-ups, but if we hit extra 10,000, then these guys, then you know, all the characters will be, are gonna be minis. Yep. Any, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, there are a lot of guys who haven't seen some of these. But this is an example of a flight board for Texas for Stogans. Same thing with the general magazine. But yeah, you'll notice there's, there's different sizes. Like each printer is going to have uh, templates for you. And the trick is. Once you uh, start reaching out to your printer and getting quotes, your graphic designer is going to get uh, pretty heavily involved, whether that's you or someone the, the, the publisher provided to you. Because they're going to talk with them and say, okay, what's what's the best way to set this up? What sizes? And uh, how many of these do we need? Do you try to stick with like, one printer for all of them? Or do you really knock it around? You should stick with one uh, just it, for, for, the, for one game. Because every time you talk to a new person, there's going to be setup costs. Uh, so, and him, Yep, yeah, they, they, yeah. Pretty much all board game printing companies are one-stop shop. Some of them won't do certain things though. Like, uh, there's a company called Quality Playing Cards. That guess what? They just do cards. Uh, they do actually do chipboards now, so they're kind of a misnomer now. But uh, they won't do minis because they're not set up for it. So, uh, but that's why also you want to talk to co uh, multiple companies. It's okay. It's not you're not cheating on anybody by by getting uh, multiple quotes. Um, and they know. Once you sign an agreement, of course, you're you're bound by a contract. But uh, uh, at, at the early stages, you should be getting a lot of different quotes from a lot of different uh, printers. And again, also a uh, different staged quotes too. You know, 50, 50 characters punch board, fifty characters as minis. Yeah, good questions. So, okay. So and also expect delays. Uh, <laughs> once you're in the board game world, like Chinese New Year's will affect your life because the country shuts down for like. Two weeks, <laughs> and uh, I would say ninety percent of the board games that you play are printed in China. That's probably even low. I would say ninety-five percent. It's probably closer. <clears throat> uh, there are very few companies that that print exclusively in, in the U.S. just because it's so much cheaper to go over there. Uh, but then you also care about dock workers' strikes too. Um, Eternal Dynasty was delayed for six months. It was sitting in a pallet uh, in a dock for six months because there was a dock worker strike in California. And so, I mean, the, when you have a physical product that you're shipping overseas, uh, that's why uh, uh, you'll see those Kickstarter, uh, uh, even for established board game uh, publishers, like they usually set a year because even if you're ready to go, uh, ready to print, printing usually takes two, three months once it's actually started. Uh, also, if you use a very uh, big name company like Panda Jam, they, they always have a queue. So uh, they're probably not going to even get to you uh, for a couple of months until after your campaign's over or whenever you're ready to, to print with them. So, uh, Eternal Dynasty, like I said, one year, and that was still not long enough. It was actually a year and a half because of the dock worker strike. So. Just expect delays when you're in the physical world. Um, when, when you get something printed, they, they like, have a lot of boxing and everything. Yep. Yeah, and they'll actually give recommendations too. You'll get, in fact, this is a picture of it. Um, this is not actually the final. Like, it's going to be, um, they'll give you uh, what's called the review copy, uh, where it's on slightly cheaper components, uh, just so you have an idea of what, what the final thing is going to look like. And you're like, oh, okay, you know, this is actually too small. Like, Eternal Dynasty, the box, like, it, <laughs> once all those pieces are popped out, it's hard to get them back in. Like, I should have gone with the bigger box, and they even recommended it, but I was like, it was like another $2 per copy, and at 20,000 copies, I'm like, mm, <laughs> maybe not. But I probably should have done it. But yeah, good question. You will get that. Yep. Um, 
So, for the, so would a printer send it directly to you and you have to distribute 20,000 copies, the, or do they send it? That is a really good question. It depends on how ambitious you are. Shipping and fulfillment. Uh, great lead-in. That's a perfect transition. Uh, I am super lazy when it comes to that kind of stuff, so that's why I, I found a co-publisher. They took care of all of that. Uh, Dan, who's lost currently, <laughs> uh, he does everything himself. Like, the UPS guy breaks his back, dropping off like a crate of games at his house like every time he finishes a Kickstarter. And he will like buy the boxes and ship them all out himself, like thousands of copies of games. And um, some people who go the extra mile, like if you can find specific components cheaper from elsewhere, like they did it on the shrink wrapping too. Uh, Jason Glover is a very prominent uh, board game designer. Uh, he has four kids who are like 10 years or older, so he has a lot of like child labor <laughs> at his disposal. <laughs> and every time they do a game, like he can find the cheapest parts and they basically do assembly line like in the basement. Like, okay, pack, you know, 100 coins, 100 gems, shrink wrap, neck, so assembly line. And then they do the same thing <laughs> when, it's, when it's time to ship. So uh, it really depends on how ambitious you are and how much of it you're willing to, to farm out to, to someone. Like, like it, is it worth your time to do it? It's absolutely cheaper if you do it yourself. But how much is your time worth? Um, especially there are, Kickstarter has been such a huge boon for the board game industry. You'll have companies now that do nothing but ship games. Like that's that's all they do. Ship Naked is a uh, offshoot of games. So they're, they're all right. I've worked with them a couple of times. Um, but they will take your list of backers and the copies and whatever they got. And then they will do the ship. The printer will ship to them. And then they'll take care of that. Oh, stretching. Good question. All right. If you're doing it yourself, you need to you have to do this uh, far before you launch the Kickstarter because that's going to affect how you set your uh, your pledge levels, right? Uh, shipping. Uh, there's one nice thing that they added to Kickstarter recently for board games. If you back one recently, uh, you can set where you live, and then the shipping will, will change accordingly based on on where you are. We didn't have that back in my day, back in my day three years ago. <laughs> when I did my last kick, so, um, so you had to calculate everything ahead of time. But now that that's there, at least you can kind of hedge your bets a little bit based on on a geography. Yes, that you can you can do either now. You can either roll it up into the pledge level, where it's just like fifty dollars if you're in the U.S. or like sixty dollars if you're in the EU. Um, but now. Um, you can set by every different region. So it's like $40 for the base pledge, and then wherever you live, wherever you selected tax on, whatever you set as the shipping cost. Is there an option to just pay yourself like, as a Oh, uh, you could. Oh, here's Dan. Dan, everybody. Hey. <laughs> we're, we're, we're in the part that we really need you for, Dan. Um, uh, we're talking about... Uh, how you actually do all your uh, shipping yourself. Oh. And I don't do that because I'm really lazy and I don't want to do that. How's it going? Sorry I'm late. I had some family stuff going on that was kind of out of my control. But I'm here now. So shipping and fulfillment? Shipping and fulfillment. Oh, my God. This is a crazy beast in, itself, in, in and of itself. So first, I mean, I got to coordinate freighting from China. Did you get to that point? Yeah. 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 Freighting and usually – so. I'm actually getting a freight. It just hit New York City port yesterday. This is Groves. The tree, Groves, the, yeah. The game that we used to be watching. And Dino Dude Ranch and its expansion. So it's uh, basically uh, cargo came into New York City port and we're splitting it because Groves did pretty well. I don't know if you told you it did pretty well on Kickstarter. And it's almost like a thousand games. And I don't want to do that myself because there's like a point where it's a lot of work and just not worth your time because you're valuable too. Um, so for my ca campaigns that are like three to 500 games, I do do them myself. And typically I do it with like Indicia. You get uh, discounted pricing for postage through Indicia. And so I get all the games freighted in my house and then I buy a lot of craft mailers on Amazon if it's a small game or I try and fit it in a padded envelope for a bigger game because they're cheap. And basically in a padded envelope it can get damaged but the cost savings, it's just easier to replace a damaged game. I think in like five to 6,000 games I've shipped out, I've had like three get damaged in the padded mailer. And where games to print cost like five to ten bucks, replacing one is a lot better than an extra dollar per game for thousands of games. So I usually find the least expensive. And if you're communicate, if you communicate well with your backers, 
and you basically explain what happened, they're usually forgiving of a damaged yeah. game. Um, but there are a lot of fulfillment companies. So uh, they're shipped naked in New Hampshire. There's uh, uh, there's uh, so some that only work the Quartermaster York. Logistics, and uh, there's one more in Portland I can't think of right now. But uh, basically all they do is fulfillment for you. So you get the trucking. If you go straight to them, you give them your list of backers, and they basically handle everything, which is like, I mean, that's maybe an hour's worth of work. All you have to do is coordinate your backer list, format it for them, and uh, basically do the rest from there. Um, did you get into, like, EU so far? Oh, yeah. Well, we talked a little bit about shipping to other regions. So, yeah, yeah um, EU has a bunch of taxes, and you have to worry about customs. Uh, so that's a lot of yeah. fun stuff if you're doing it yourself. Um, yeah, yeah. So, so basically, when they import, there's the VAT tax, which is about I think 20% of the cost. So, a lot of times, though, what happens is if you don't cover it uh, yourself, when a backer gets a game, they have to pay. I mean, it could be anywhere between five and ten dollar taxes on a twenty dollar game with that. You know, that was maybe fifteen bucks in shipping. So now you're adding another five to ten percent at least onto it. And this really pisses people off, basically. Um, so, so the best way to do it is to import them into the European Union first and then have a fulfillment center there distributed out to everybody else. Yep. And uh, basically what happens is when they import it, they charge me the VAT. I cover that. I pad that into the costs ahead of time so that it's not like a fee that really I'm necessarily paying. But it's a lot cheaper to have me do it that way. Because then the VAT is only on what I paid to, to print the games, which is a lot less than that game's actual value um, than what the backer paid. Um, so typically what I do, and actually it's ridiculous. I don't know how they do this, but I, I work with GamesQuest, and they're in the United Kingdom. And basically I, I just set it up, and they have a, an account with DHL, and they do such high volumes that they can do DHL Express two-day shipping. Basically it takes two days from my house to their warehouse, and it's... I mean, a fifth of the cost of what it would cost me to normally do it. And so it works out really well. Uh, having them basically from my door to all the backers' door going through the fulfillment center, it ends up being between $10 and $15 per game, which is actually pretty cheap total from freighting here to there and the distribution. That, that touches on a crowdfunding point, too, that I meant to uh, address. Um, when it's more expensive for one place, people don't understand paying more in shipping, but... Like an EU backer, the last thing they want to see is it costs them $5 more for whatever reason. So a lot of times people will spread that cost among every, all the backers. Like mm -hmm. instead of it being $30 for US backers and $35 for EU backers and more for shipping, it's $32 for everybody. So that way you don't have one segment of angry backers. And people who may skip on it altogether because they see that they're getting charged more. So that's just a, a kind of funny thing to consider when you're, when you're setting your pledge levels. Yeah. So, yeah. Good timing. Sorry, sorry. And sorry I'm talking fast. I'm like, when do we just sprint it here? Because I parked in the lot, wrong lot as well. So. Yes, I, I know. I texted, it was I texted horrible. My GPS didn't know what it was doing. All right. So, so any, any other questions about shipping? The phone um, If you hire a company in the U.S., do they hire your Yeah, I mean, if you depending on the company. Some will just do U.S., but if you, you can find ones that do everything. Uh, ship naked and... Um, Quartermaster. Quartermaster. They actually have uh, headquarters in the EU too, so they're shipping to themselves. So they save a lot of money by ha by having a headquarters in the, in the in the EU also. So I will say for my latest one. So so yeah, Ship Naked does. They coordinate all of it and they'll do that. So you basically have the freight go to them and then they handle everything else. But with my most recent campaign, the cost to actually have it go to their fulfillment center was actually a lot more than me having Games Quest, the company I work with, actually do it um, through me. So it's a little more headache on my part because I have to get another another like three to 400 games to me freighted there. But as long as I don't mind coordinating that, it's actually a pretty significant cost uh, savings on my part doing it that way. So working directly with my fulfillment center has worked, but they offered to do it for me. And a lot of that is how much legwork are you willing to do? Um, yeah. Jamie Stegmaier, if you read his Kickstarter lessons, he talks about all the steps that he did setting up a, a chain of distribution. And that's actually the uh, next part. Uh, because it's one thing to get it, ship it to your Kickstarter backers, but now presumably you want to sell it on game stores too, right? And that's where you need uh, distributors and what's known as consolidators. They're the guys who are going to uh, to get your game on, on, on game store shelves. Uh, I know Dan's worked with a couple. Um, consolidators are kind of an in-between world. Uh, well, let me step back one sec. If you have a publisher, they're going to handle all of this for you. So that's one of the nice things about, okay, sell it, forget it. Um, but if you're doing it yourself, uh, those, those games, game stores aren't going to stock 
not your game. So unless you uh, line up uh, a distributor or consolidator. Distributors uh, usually will only work with proven uh, bigger companies, the bigger distributors. So like your one Kickstarter, if it's your first one, they're probably not going to buy it. Um, unless you hit like a million and a half, they're like, oh, okay, there's obvious demand for this. Um, that's where there's the kind of that in-between step, which is a consolidator. They'll, they'll buy like 500 of your game or uh, 100 or some smaller quantity. They'll charge you maybe uh, space uh, per month for whatever doesn't sell, but they'll work and, and get it on shelves for you. So they're kind of an intermediary salesperson. So you're paying you're paying middleman. But uh, they're kind of the same thing too, where a lot of them, if you reach out, they're just, I mean, there's so many games coming out, so many new publishers, yeah. so many new companies. I think last year it was like 3,500 yeah. new games. Yeah. Came out I mean, kick, something kick, ridiculous like that. Kick, kicks out yeah. cause an explosion. Of and so companies stuff. can't keep up with that because they do, they need to buy me on sell them. And you can't pitch to a retail store 3,500 games in a year or whatever it ends up being. So a lot of them just really aren't taking people. And I, I mean, I've been doing this for years and every year every new game i call and they always they're really nice and they'll say well not this time around but maybe the next time or something like that uh just because they are they they need to i mean tried and true companies that are putting out five games six games they need to know you're going to come back your games are going to sell you're going to market them uh because they can't do all the marketing for all that for that number of games either um so it's really hard getting your foot in so going to trade shows and conventions is really big because if you meet them you can show them your game in person they can see the quality they can see uh the gameplay um they can see you and know that you're you know a nice person someone easy to work with uh they're probably more likely to establish a relationship with you and work with you further than just hard calling them i mean it can work with hard calling and i've done that and i've you know i mean i had a distributor that i talked to today that wants a lot of grows actually and it's just through relationships and calling for years and we you know we've done it that way but um really i think getting the shows uh gen con origins uh gamma is a big one that's coming up oh, that's yeah, more of a trade, trade show, show yeah. and um that's a big one for meeting a lot of these distributors retailers and uh, people who might carry your game so this is all the stuff you get to deal with if you self publish um, actually, it's not a Yes, uh, because I, I've used fulfillment companies for all my uh, cases. So yes, I've run into that problem a couple of times, um, and, and, and that really depends on your personal approach. For me personally, it, it only comes up maybe five times a campaign, so I will handle it. I'll you know I'll reach out to the, the company and say, hey, can we make sure to take care of this person? And usually they're pretty good about it. But right, um, Eternal Dynasty because it's sold out. There's no more replacement parts, and <laughs> the company's like they're not handling it anymore. So I get all the emails like, hey, you know this part is missing or defective or it broke or my dog ate it or whatever. And then so they contact me. I'm like, uh, <laughs> well, bad news. Uh, it's actually out of print. So uh, you're you're going to run into that because you're you're the especially if you're the running the Kickstarter, you're the face of that product. Right. So uh, yeah. right. It, I mean that, that's kind of, that, you you can, but that's a bit of a cop out, um, especially if you're new and you're trying to build your your reputation. So I I, I would always handle it um, or, or make sure that I, I personally reached out to uh, the fulfillment company to make sure that that got handled. Yeah, I have a couple stories too, actually. So um, I have a blog post that I wrote actually that's about unforeseen costs that you can rise in your kickstarters and just ones I've had in my kickstarters. And actually, one thing that happened when I sent to my European uh, Union fulfillment company, this is not the one I use now. But a previous one, I sent them some packages. Time went by. We didn't hear anything. And, I mean, it was getting to the point where I was almost late on delivering the Kickstarter. They, they hadn't received the games. They hadn't cleared customs. And we weren't really hearing anything for, from it. And one day I get home and there's a box on my doorstep. And it's cases of the games. And I was just like, shit. And so I opened up. And basically I was missing one packing slip inside the box that customs needed. And, I mean, it was my first time doing it. This was my fir first one, lesson learned. Um, so I was missing this one packing okay, slip. Back. Yep, <laughs> customs needed it. That basically was a breakdown of what was in the box, how many, their value, and all of that. And so the games got shipped back to my doorstep. So I had to basically, I mean, that was a, a couple, I want to say it was like $200 to just ship it to the fulfillment center, these two cases that I had. So I had to just go back and $200, pay it again. And just ship it again, and it was just an unforeseen cost. And that's, I mean, what are you, what are you gonna do, right? I mean, I can't not deliver it. 
And then um, I've read some stories of some other companies having issues with you. There are a lot of horror stories online you can read that are which companies, if you talk to me at some point, yeah. I can tell you too. But uh, there, are, there are issues people have had with fulfillment companies and kind of, yeah, I always have extra product that you can do. Most problems I try and handle myself because with the go-between, it's it's really hard. I mean, I, just communicating with them, some are in the European Union. They're at five, six hours later than us. Some are in China. If you, you know, these fulfillment centers, they're, they're 12 hours later than us. So you send an email saying, we need this part to go out. Two days later, you hear back, okay, what do you need us to do? And then a day later, I mean, it's just this phone tag. So it's almost better just package up what's missing or, you know, ship another game um, and just send it to the backer. And usually if it's like a problem that I can't replace without just sending a whole new game, I'll send it and say, can you just give the damaged box or whatever it is to your local game store and have them use it as a demo copy or your library or something like that. So it spreads the word and, you know, just kind of, you got to bite it and have a lot of extra games and money on hand for problems because they will arise. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Usually do, and uh, actually, I actually have a couple copies of Eternal Legacy to give away. Speaking of which, these are sold out, and I got a case of <laughs> a half case of them. So I'll let Wes decide what he wants to do with them. Yeah, yeah, and I always yeah. usually have a lot of cases sent to me because going to conventions and things, it's easier to just pack up a couple cases and truck them myself or whatever it is. So, um, so I always have a lot of extra product on hand just for that. Corey, do you have questions? Uh, yeah, I didn't want to go backwards, but it's like. I missed that part, so this isn't going backwards for me, this is going forward. Is it usually Well, usually they're not going to make the molds until they're ready to print. Uh, and if, when you're talking to the, the big name printers like Panda GM or what have you, uh, they'll, they'll be very upfront. They're like, hey, we have, we're currently looking at a three to four month. When are you running your Kickstarter? At that time, we anticipate, you know, this, uh, it'll be, you know, two or three months to print at that time. Or do you mean for reprints? Go to the printing company and say, I'm going to run 20,000 copies of this game, and they all sell this weekend. And you got the greatest game that's ever made, and now you want 100,000 copies. Are you starting all over again? Yes. It, so well, uh, well, oh, no, Depends no, no, on how no. much time has elapsed. Oh, sorry, you mean for, like, the dies and the setup fees and stuff like that? Uh, so, oh, so I was going to say, so I just did a reprint of one game I printed in 2014. They, I mean, they still had everything, so. Um, so it's not like official how long? No. Yeah, I mean, not that I've seen, but I mean, that was only, I mean, that's still only four years, so. Yeah. But I, I think that would vary from company to company. Yeah. yeah. Uh, can you mention replacement parts for stuff? Um, do you, obviously you've extra games at your house and you have replacement parts, but do you actually order, like, 20,000 copies and then 100 games of replacements? Yep. Or? So, well, yeah, so... Most printers, uh, most companies and publishers set it up that way, too. They'll, they'll make sure to order just extra parts, even without the boxes, so... Yeah, yeah so, I'll, and I'll say, too, I've had two different scenarios with um, the printer I've used. One, uh, for my first two games, they sent me just cases of spare parts, because they, they do an overrun anyway in case right, things are damaged or problems. Yeah. And if there aren't damages, they'll just send you cases of the extra, like, you know, I've had custom dice or custom pawns. And so they'll just send me bags of tons of them, which are great, because then you can, like, I mean, just sell those as extra things people love, too, to make earrings or whatever it is out of the extra pieces. I mean, you just carry them, you're like, five bucks? I don't know. And, you know, I mean, it, and it works really well. Um, but they do that for when you have missing parts. But then my another game I did, they didn't have a lot of extra parts like that. But they just sent me another case with 36 extra games. It was like, here's an overrun of 36 games, um, more than you requested, and just use that for spare parts. And so, um, you know, it varies. But the problem is they never send extra boxes, typically. It's right. always spare parts. So if someone gets a damaged box, you're cannibalizing it just a new game. Which, that's why I just send a whole new game. Because yes, you have so many spare parts, parts, it's like, take this game, game, give the dented box to a store or a library, and then they can yeah. play it damaged and, you know, spread the word. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good stuff. All right. That's heavy. Back to distribution. Back to distribution. Well, I, I think we, we pretty much wrap that up um, in terms of, you know, what, what you're going to be doing. Uh, you know, basically, it's, you know, uh, working to beat, right? You're reaching out to people, trying to make those connections, trying to find distributors and consolidators who are willing to work with you. Um, otherwise, sell to a publisher. All right. So this is a... Uh, Princess Plan reference. Uh, 
digital board games are so huge. Like if you go the iOS, iOS, uh, like the top paid apps, like there are a ton of board games on there. Um, so I don't, because you guys are, a lot of you guys are Magic students. So I want you guys to know that um, hopefully you didn't waste your time today listening to us talk. Uh, because you can apply a lot of this. You know, you have the paper prototyping that you can do. That should help you with your video game design too. Uh, just, you know, try it out. See see what you can find out very quickly, what, what concepts work and, and what don't. Um, you make a digital version of the existing board game. A lot of really good ones out there, like Lords of Waterdeep, Carcassonne, Roll For It, Buddy Chris. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's his game. Stone Age. So there's really good ones uh, that exist there. So uh, you can always do that. You can just make an ad uh, adaptation. You can make a video game that's basically a board game in all by name, but like oh, Hearthstone is probably the one that you're most familiar with, but Antihero, Calculords, a Sean Baby's game, uh, those are basically board games, right? Uh, even the new one from the FTL guys, right? It's, it's, a, it's a tactical mini game, right? Yeah. Sorry, what was the name of it? Into the Bridge, thank you. So yeah, uh, a lot of those, I mean, they're, they're basically board games that, that are, are being made as digital games. Uh, or make something that's both. Uh, there's a kind of a dungeon exploration game called Descent, and there's actually an app. Uh, it's basically a Dungeons and Dragons without a DM, and there's an app for it that it's it's now the DM. So there, there's there's room for integration between the yeah. two too if you really want to explore that space. If I could jump in, um, yesterday on Kickstarter, uh, this campaign launched for it's called Chronicles of Crime, and it's basically a uh, th like there's a crime scene and you're trying to solve it and they have all different uh, scenarios But basically it's a board game set up with all sorts of tokens and clues out there But one person grabs their phone they strap VR goggles on or <laughs> VR glasses that one player is doing it And they as they move they can see through the crime scene and they're telling the other players at the board what they're seeing and they pick up clues and throughout the board and then they relate what they're finding and they uh, they look into seeing if those are actually relevant to the crime scene and there's Part of an app integration that deals with that, and um, it's pretty neat involving this app with the board game, and it's actually pretty cool, and it's so that's doing like, really, uh, really well. It's so. like Arkham VR in the board game, right? Yeah, cool. it's, it's really neat, and so it just launched yesterday. So if you go to Kickstarter, it's called Chronicles of Crime, and it does that too, and it looks really neat. Yeah. So keep keep in mind that uh, the the tenets of game design are still very similar. Again, we get, you have those different life cycles, right, between design and production, but the the core ideas are are still all there. And wouldn't be complete without uh, shameless self-promotion. Uh, but this is what Dan and I are working on, um, Fantasy Tactics. Um, it's a tactical board game, which is, you know, again, board game influenced by video game, influenced back again as a board game. And I'm even working on the terrible uh, digital version of it, where the AI is really buggy. It doesn't work well. But, <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's, you know, it's just kind of a, something that shows you, you can do both, right? And it just shows you how easily, it, uh, you know, it can translate from analog to digital and back again. Is our baby Paul? <laughs> that was me a few years. What's that? <laughs> <laughs> He's five months. Quick question. Sorry if you missed this, but um, when publishing a Kickstarter in, in a couple of other fields, Kickstarter allows you to basically kickstart between I think, 30 and 60 days. Mm -hmm. So in, in some other areas, they have like, it, when, when, when publishing stuff, they say like, your best to publish at 30 days, your best to publish at 40 days. Did you guys find a kind of sweet spot with that, or is it better, like, the longer time? Shorter campaigns are generally better, uh, and that's kind of counterintuitive, right? You would think the longer time you have to get word out there, uh, the better it is. But there's actually a sense of urgency when people see, oh, there's only seven days left, I got it back now. Uh, Thirty days is the sweet spot. If you're a Jamie Stegmaier, someone who has instant recognition, they actually like Jamie's last one was like he doesn't even use it anymore. He's that's how successful he is. He doesn't even need more a Kickstarter. But his last one before that was like 15 days. Please. Uh, his audience knew, like he has that built-in audience that has his newsletter, uh, you know, follows him on Facebook and Twitter and all that other stuff. And so they, they, they get there, it, you know, there's a huge swell. Um, that first 24 hours is where you're going to get on Kickstarter's trending list. And also that's, um, that's the only time they're going to look at your project for as a staff pick. Uh, very rarely do they pick a project and it's, you know, as it's winding up as a, as a staff pick. And you can get a lot of eyeballs when, when your project's on the, on the front page of Kickstarter for your category. Yeah, and I'll say too about it. Um, so 30 days was really popular when I really started Kickstarting a few years ago. Uh, and then um, basically what happens is if you go longer than that, uh, I mean, first of all, you get fatigued. When you're running a Kickstarter, every night you're posting updates, <laughs> answering questions. I mean, 
it's ridiculous how much you have to address and handle when you're doing it. And if you have a life outside of it as well, like I have a day job or if you're in school or doing whatever it is you're doing, I mean, doing that every day for 60 days is horrendous. And so on top of that too, he's, he's right about like the, um, there's like an excitement and drive with your campaign and you want to keep that going, whether it be with stretch goals or updates or whatever it is. And you, you really only have so much content to update people on. So you don't want to just be like, Hey, me again, this campaign's going great. And like, like no one gets excited or charged over that and spacing them out over 60 days. That's kind of what you have to do. So the 30 days allows you to, to really manage all of that. Then like a year or two ago, people started cutting down and doing three week campaigns and someone recently tried a two week campaign. And what they found was if you have an existing audience, it works. But at the same time, there are like news cycles. There are board game content creators who publish the first Tuesday of every month or whatever it is. So 30 days allows you to hit all of these different creators who are going to cover your right. campaign, which are going to get more people into it. So right around, I, I think I usually do 30 days because I like to launch on a Tuesday and end on a Thursday. So I do four weeks plus two days. Um, my last one, which was a really small campaign right around Christmas, I cut a week short just because I didn't want to deal with Christmas <laughs> and people stopping buying things. But um, typically, I'd say 30 days is really a sweet spot. Too short and you're going to miss a lot. And I mean, as long as you're having positive days, up to 30 is where I would cut it. After that, you're going to just get burnt out. And it really is. It's going to be like very lulled, even with a 30-day campaign. And there are days you're like, just like end this like what, like it, it just drags and if you only get one backer that day and you're like attached to your phone like why isn't anyone backing it's like that happens but it's it's stressful and it's hard right so 30 days right and, and when they stretch out too long um backers are actually going to drop out mm -hmm. uh because new campaigns are going to launch when they when most board game campaigns are all 30 days right. uh you know by the if you're doing 60 do 60 day campaign there's going to be two that's two other campaigns worth cycles worth of time so all those twice as many new games are going to come out. People are going to decide their dollars are better spent elsewhere. And mm -hmm. you're going to see a lot of drop pledges. Like I, uh, I've seen a lot of people try to do longer ones. And uh, you'll see that during that lull, they're actually they're losing momentum. And then that kills you as you're heading into the final 38 hours when Kickstarter sends out the notifications. People see that the campaign's actually been losing money. And so you know, you're starting off uh, you know, at the bottom of the hill. Yeah. And also, like, at the end of the month when people have to pay a lot of bills or things like that, you see a lot of people drop right. out. Or I mean, random things happen where people just drop out from that. And if you're covering two cycles of that, it's just like, yeah, I'd say 30 days. Um, people you guys know about, like, shipping board games over an entire year, what would you say are, like, the key points of the year that you said that? Like, Avoid like, February, year, because Chinese New Year. Yeah. Uh, uh, Christmas, like, yeah. financial years for yeah. Summer, people tend to be flush and willing to spend money. I like spring break, like early. Yeah, there's yeah, there's a lot of data for which months are best for like launching Kickstarters, and um, really it picks up like now. Uh, there are a lot of campaigns launching now, and this goes very hard through June to July. Um, there are some campaigns that launch through then, and some do well, some don't, and then it picks up again August to September. And then once October, November hit, it really dies out. And that's not just because people aren't launching and be like, oh, that's a great time. No one else is live. It's horrible because of holidays and because of other you, things. You can that. capitalize on that, though. It's like movie release schedules, right? Yeah. Black Bath and killed it because there's no other huge movies on February. Right. right. And it's awesome. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, I mean, there, there's reasons. Uh, but I would think about it the same thing as like a studio planning out a movie release. Like, what's the competition? You know, yeah. what are the spending habits of the consumers? And a lot of that research is, is out there. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, like yeah. shipping? Oh, yeah, yeah. Fe fe February. Shipping? Yeah. February, yeah. You always want to make sure it's going to get on a boat before February. So that's one thing I did was I made sure <laughs> my last campaign and everything was going to end and be on a boat before February. And I coordinated with them, like, we got to make sure this is done. Because even when they're done printing, they move it to a warehouse and they coordinate with the freight. Then they coordinate to move it from the warehouse to a boat. And so, I mean, it's not like the day it's done printing, it gets on a boat. So I was like, okay, well, we need a boat ready before it's done printing, because when it's done, we need like a day or two later because we're cutting it close to February. Once it's on the boat, Chinese New Year, China shuts down, but, but it's, it's ready, on a boat. A <laughs> you're, you're good. Um, so it's really making sure that like that's coordinated for that. Other than that, even around Christmas, I mean, you don't want to be shipping the week before Christmas, but I mean, yeah, that, I mean even in November, I mean, mail's not that delayed. And I mean, a couple hundred packages is like, I mean, that's normal for the post office, I'd say. So, um, yeah. Good question. Um, so when you're exhibiting, uh, exhibiting a game, like a festival or convention, do you find people are willing to like sit down for a whole game cycle? Because like, I mean, I know it's like 
Right. Yeah. Um, for for dedicated board game conventions, absolutely. Like Eternal Dynasty takes like an hour, hour and a half, and I spent two days at Gen Con just playing that game nonstop. People will sit through, and I even did a Hero Forget tournament one year at Gen Con too, because that's a dedicated audience. They all want to play board games, and they all want to see new board games. Um, I, you know, it was a little bit different at you know the Maker Fair or uh, um, Rock Game Fest because that was I think more oriented at uh, video games. Uh, but I mean, if you have like people willing to demo, that there, there's going to be at least one or two, per, uh, a couple people who are, who are willing to sit down and play. Yeah, and I think it looks. It depends what you're looking to get out of that show. Because I mean, so for a lot I'm going to now, I'm not necessarily pushing one game. So I, I I have like four or five games I'm selling right now. And so if I have a table with all of them, I can't really run through unless people are really interested. And if they are, I'll, I'll gladly sit and go through a whole thing with them. So I I work on like my. It's not even a one-minute pitch. It's like a 30-minute pitch. Why is this game, you know, a good fit? What's it do that's different? What's exciting about it? And I run down each game, and then I say, like, is there one you want to hear more about? You know, and typically, actually, before I even do any of that, I just say, what kind of games do you like? Because, I mean, they don't want to hear about these games. If they don't if they don't like co-ops and you have a co-op, why are you going to explain it? For, like, and I tell them, my throat's hurt, and I've been talking all day. I don't want to talk to you about something you don't give a crap about, right? I mean, really, right? It's a waste of my time and yours. So I'll just say, what kind of games do you play? What, what, what do you like? And if they tell me, I'm like, all right, well, like, let me tell you about this game first because this is probably the best towards your taste. And, you know, once you have a lot of games, you have to kind of do that just because, I mean, yeah, you're going to be at this for eight hours and see a lot of people, and you just want to hit, like, what they're going to like. Tell them about it. If they want to hear a run-through, go through it. Um, but really work on, like, the 30-minute and one-minute pitches of what's make, what makes it unique. It's almost like on the Kickstarter video or the first blurb on a Kickstarter page, the first paragraph about what's the game plan why is it exciting impression. that's like what you're doing in person and why in your game it's neat and interesting and it's just like 30 seconds boom 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 and you know and then if you want to hear more we'll go through it and, uh, one yeah. thing i found about the board game audience is that they're an extremely informed group of customers mm -hmm. uh like there is uh board game geek uh are you guys familiar with that website that's like the repository for all board game information like the interface is terrible but there's so much information there that people go there anyway <laughs> so um it's like the IMDb of board games. Uh, anytime you need to know something about something in board games, you go to boardgamegeek.com. And uh, they will come to conventions, like even before the game is released, knowing about your game. If you've been, you know, especially if you've been a publisher or you've been marketing it yourself. And so they'll come and say, I want to play this game. So uh, at, a, at a board game specific convention, absolutely. Like you'll, you'll get a lot of, a lot of time playing. But uh, a general kind of like sci-fi convention or something. What's the hardest part? What's the longest part? I'd say, I mean, a lot of it's hard. Uh, well, if you're publishing it yourself, if you're designing it, it's... Designing's fun. For designing's me. a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, and I like publishing, but it's it's a lot of work. I mean, it's legit. I mean, just, I mean, you got to build a whole company. You have to be on social media 24-7. You know, just being out there, being relevant and not being in touch with people coordinating freight, coordinating shipments, dealing with it. It's just a lot of logistics. So if you don't like like spreadsheets and like not getting to design as much because you got to do that, it's really hard. And that's, you know, finding time to do it all. I don't design as many games as much anymore because I develop a lot and yeah. do it. But really... That's why you can sell it to a publisher. Yeah, figuring out when a game is done, that's pretty hard. Okay. And balancing it. I mean, just getting hundreds of playtests in is, I think... For me, the really toughest... The toughest part is uh, running the Kickstarter. Uh, it's so nerve-wracking, even after you've done a couple. Uh, like I don't sleep well in, in general, but like during a Kickstarter, like I, I, I sleep probably like three day, three actual days worth of sleep. I'm launching one in like in in yeah. three months. It's not even soon, and I'm already like not sleeping <laughs> about it because I'm like we have to hit these deadlines and get this ready and get this like live for marketing before then and. I'm already freaking out about it, and I have like four more months yeah. to freak I mean, out about it. They're called campaigns for a reason. It's like running for office. Like you have to be on 24/7. You have to respond to questions. You have to talk to all your backers. You have to market yourself. You have to get out there and, and really sell sell your product. So talking about actually selling a product to, to a, a producer, um, how would you guys recommend that like, for all the hackers that approach? How would you recommend approaching someone like you guys? Like what is the best way to cold call you guys? That's not going to be to, to affront it, to, you know, aggressive. Do it organically, yeah. whatever that means. Um, <laughs> for me, so I don't know, everyone's different. For me, I answer most emails, and I usually start with just give me a, a PDF of the rules, 
if there's a pitch video, that's awesome. Like a yes. video where I can see it played and how it looks on the table. It may be terrible, but I can get a sense of how it's going to look, look and how it's going to work and if it's unique just from like the video. So that's usually ideal. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, a lot of times a sell sheet and rules because I'll read through rules quick and just see if I notice something. I mean, if it's not anything really interesting or new or different about it, even if it's like a unique spin on something, if it's not that different, I, I'm usually just like, I don't have, you know, time to develop this game or if it's not in the genre I'm looking for or, you know, um, if it's not going to do anything that advances my brand. Um, so I usually just ask for rules and a sell sheet real yeah. quick. So would it would be best to reach out to you first and just see if you're interested in events? Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. It, it, same thing is like, you guys love telemarketers, right? Yeah. Yeah, nobody loves telemarketers. Like that, that cold call, like no, nobody wants to be the guy who's, who's getting cold calls. And the other thing too is a lot of people are afraid to share their designs early because they're worried people are going to steal them, which they're not. And I can get a whole different discussion about why. Yeah. But I know so many people have been published because they share pictures on Twitter or Instagram and they just share a lot and people get involved and then publishers see it and they're like, whoa, what that's actually a better there? way to protect your really ideas too, yeah. getting out of the public space. And uh, yeah. So, and then they know like, cause people help develop it online. Yeah. So they know that like other people outside of you and your friends have been working on it and people start sending out print and plays and they get up people online to play them. And then a publisher sees this and they say, you know what, we could actually take that and market it. And I've actually approached people because of that too. I see a picture on the line. I'm like, that looks kind of cool. Yeah. Why don't you send me you know, a, a PDF of the rules and I'll check it out. And so I think just sharing it, getting it out there, and like then connecting with people online and talking to them. I know, like, so actually the guy who designed Groves had been pitching me games for two years. And I was like, I, he'd send me one. I was like, eh, it's okay. <laughs> and, oh, it's good, but I don't want to publish it. And then finally we clicked and it was like, let's just go on this, man. And we... So it was just like we had become friends online and we played each other's games playtesting beforehand. And it was like two years that we were playtesting each other's games before we finally had one together that clicked. So it's really just making connections and, you know, staying true to it. Like you said, that organic personalization of it. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, when, when you're pitching to a publisher, uh, you know, have that sell sheet. Video is, is great, but not yeah. necessary. Uh, but make sure you have that, like you, you've worked on that elevator pitch that if you actually get the attention of a publisher, make sure you're going to use that five minutes wisely. Uh, because some people will, will talk to you and then they, they freeze up. And, and I actually have stumbled a couple of pitches selling uh, too, because I was like, oh crap, I'm actually prepared for this like really hyper-focused five minutes. So make sure, make sure you are ready for that. And, uh, no and because then if they like that, then they're going to ask for a full playthrough. And know the publisher, because they're, like yep. publishers do have like a personality of games they publish. There are types of games they do, types of art they use, and types of what? <laughs> Let me talk about it. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, you talked about it. But whatever. I mean, it's true. Publishers have a set line of games they do. So if they only do a certain type and you send them a, something that's not even close to their line, they're not going to really. I mean, it's just a waste of their time, really, and yours. So uh, find people that would work with it and tell them why you like their line and how your game fits in it. It's like your style of games, but you don't have one that does this yet. So this is really cool. And this fits in really well with your line. So consider it. Yeah. Really do your research. Um, like you should spend three months minimum writing your Kickstarter, planning for it. Uh, before you, you even think about going live. And you should market it starting like three months early. <laughs> exactly. I mean, yeah. I mean, that's the thing, so too. Is really my right. first campaign, which was, it didn't do, I mean, it funded, but it was barely, and it didn't do great, was I wasn't ready the first day. I didn't have backers. So Kickstarter doesn't really magically bring, they do bring people to your campaign, but they're not going to bring enough to fund. You need to bring people, and that's just through, I mean, for me, it's been three years of smaller campaigns building and building an audience and you know growing my my mail list from like 50 people to a couple thousand you know i mean it's just a slow progression every time you get a couple hundred more people who like you and what you do and they you know they like your games and so that first campaign i just i didn't have that day one people ready to back people i knew were going to back and you need to have 30 percent like whether it's through your marketing, you know, I'm going to, you know, put ads on this page and get this many backers from it. And this reviewer is going to bring this many. My mom's going to back. And, you know, my 10 friends are going to back. I mean, it's true. Like all these people add up, but you need that 30% coming and you need to know where they're coming from. And I did not my first campaign. And now I do. Every time I launch a campaign, I'm like ready. I know roughly how many I'm going to get the first day because of the way I'm outreaching and the responses I'm getting, the groups I'm building on Facebook to like, you know, be involved in my events so I can 
kind of tally how many are going to be there that first day. My wife is always my first backer for every yeah. campaign. <laughs> so don't don't be afraid. Like that, that every yeah. every bit helps, and it, you know it generates that momentum. Like I, I, I actually always do a five dollar Dunkin' Donuts gift card to my first backer. <laughs> I'm like you you came at seven a.m. Here's a coffee, and I mail him a, a little yeah. gift card because yeah. It's so little incentives that just make yeah. it fun and it gets people excited about it, you know. Uh, and board game Kickstarter is uh, you're shipping a physical product too, so there's an extra level of planning involved. Like there's yeah. no Steam for board games, like that'd be great, right? Let's get on that. <laughs> but uh, yeah. that's that's so you, you need, as I said, I, I would say three months minimum. If your first, if it's your first one, so start planning at six months, yeah. And talk to people, right? I mean, I'm local and I've done this a lot, so you can Same. talk to me. But yeah. there are a lot of people online who. Write blogs or just would answer questions about it. So just reach out to them yeah. and talk to a lot of people ahead of time and back a lot of campaigns, even for a dollar. That's what I do too, to just see like, I mean, things change all the time, the way people run campaigns, how they're done. So I'm like every month always backing something new, even for a dollar, just to get updates, see how they run their uh, their surveys and see how the rewards are, you know, how they ask questions about them, how they do their kind of marketing and those as well. Um, because there's always something to learn and someone's going to do it better than you. But if you like learn from it, you can do it too. And so... It's just being involved with it constantly, just to learn from it. Yep. Uh, James Matthew and Jamie Stegmaier of Stonemaier Games, like they have really great articles, and they are like champions of Kickstarter. Uh, and they're also very friendly. Like when I was starting up, I talked to both of them, and they were very helpful. Uh, yeah. So you know, and Dan and I are local. You know, I, I'm not able to get out to too many of the game dev meetups, but I'm going to try and be here. So don't, I mean, don't be afraid to hit yeah. us up. And as I said, so the one that the, the top one, Stonemeyer Games, uh, although James is good, really good too, actually Stonemeyer Games, I mean, there are literally hundreds of articles that take at least like a week to like thoroughly go through right. them, but, but they're so them. informative. He even had one last week that I, I bookmarked for when I launched my next campaign because it's like, he, he had someone who was really good at doing Facebook ads. And this is like, this is step by step the best way to do it, who to target, how to do it and what to make the ads say and how to do them. And he had that on his most recent one. And I was like, oh, I, I really suck at Facebook ads. But like, I mean, they work. And actually, they're finding that it's the best return on investment for most ads yep. in a Kickstarter. It's better than Board Game Geek yep. now, which used to be the best. Yep. And But if you don't know how to do it, you know, yeah, it's not going to do anything for you. So like, his, his blog is super helpful. So I would suggest reading yeah. through it at least twice before you launch a campaign. And there's a lot of things we laugh at, like BuzzFeed titles, right? But they get people to click, right? Number six will make you crazy. Okay. All right, well, okay, I guess what's number six? Why is this game, board game the greatest <laughs> yeah, game ever? And exactly. I was like, why? Yeah. It's, like, it's not. Really great. <laughs> but you clicked and you're at the campaign now. <laughs> so got you. To the late, got your click. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, a lot of those sites, uh, unless you're established, they're they're not even going to answer that email. It's, like it's going to go straight to spam. Uh, and be aware of people who are marketing companies that are going to help you out. Don't SEO pay companies. any of them. No. Yeah. I mean, there there are maybe a handful in this being generous that are actually worth the money. And even those aren't like they've made it say, <laughs> even like, no, those aren't. Even yeah, no, none of them. Backer club, backer kit, any of them. Yeah. They'll say they'll bring you the backers they want. They're just gonna take your money. Yeah. And some of them like will show money into your campaign so it funds, yeah. and then you have to pay them. And it's just this whole thing that screws you. And it's really. Bad. But yeah, um, there absolutely are those YouTube influencers. Dice Tower is a big one for board game world. Um, Rado runs through it. I know you've used Rado before. So yeah, you're going to reach out to those people uh, and say, hey, can you produce a video? Would you like to, uh, to check out this prototype? And, and then you're going to have that ready for the Kickstarter. Yeah, and, and that's why I said the 30-day campaign because there are content creators who do those cycles. And so I think um, knowing who they are, but a lot of times too, if you reach out to them, I mean, sometimes they'll pick you up, but sometimes they just organically pick you up too. So for my Groves campaign, I didn't reach out to them, but I think Board Panda, which is pretty big, covered us. Huffington Post, I, I was in like, and it was a collection of like, one was like board game cover art that should be in a museum, five current Kickstarter campaigns, and mine was one of them. And I think it was someone else who pitched to them, was like, hey, these five games are on there, and they contacted me like, do you want to be covered in here? I was like, of course, I think, yeah, I do. And so sometimes they'll just pick you up if you invest in the art ahead of time or, you know, whatever it is. Um, to me. Yeah, I mean, that's why it's, you can get by with not a full product when you launch, but the more you do, 
the more it'll get noticed and be picked up for these things. Like the video game category, the board game category is, is very sophisticated now. It's, it's very developed. You need to have a 99% fin or even better finished mm -hmm. product uh, if you get it. Or, or you, because most people will see an unfinished idea on Kickstarter and, they're like, eh, and they'll see something that's completely polished and they'll back that instead. Mm -hmm. It, if you can go to the printer, flax it, play it, and it's a complete experience, then then I would say that that's when you know you're writing. Yeah, and I mean, so for a lot of it too, I mean, because there are a lot of different parts to this. So one is art, and uh, I wrote a blog post on how much art is enough, and I think you should have at least for board games, this would be at least a, a box cover because you need something that like gives them an idea of what the, the com game is going to look like, the physical product, and then one of each type of component because you want to display how everything's going to look. So if you have 100 cards, but you only have like three different types, I mean, you could get away with just one art for each different type and then just put a fan of fake cards underneath it. You know what I mean? <laughs> and be like, 100 cards. Um, but, but you know, as long as you have enough of each for the art, that's, you know, so that you can see every piece. Um, reviewers, getting that to them a month early, uh, because a lot of people I've seen launch and they're just like, well, the review didn't get done in time because I didn't mail it to them last week and I had to launch today. It's like, you didn't have to launch today. Wait till like they have it and yeah. you have a review. These, these are all things you need. Yeah, Final don't, don't, art, don't get reviews, um, and all the pieces to your page, you know, built for it. Yeah. If you need to wait another month to get to the next cycle, wait another month instead yeah. of uh, launching hap haphazardly. Yeah. I guess in addition to seeing the components, but how do you know gameplay wise? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I think that kind of goes back to to the testing. Uh, well, first, first of all, again, you're your most important tester. Uh, if it's a game that's fun for you, uh, you know, unless it's Dwarf Fortress. Sorry, <laughs> you know it's probably gonna be fun for other people, uh, and even the even Dwarf Fortress has its fan, fans, obviously. So uh, you know, um, so if, if you enjoy it, and especially this is where blind playtesting can be really valuable. If you show it to a bunch of strangers and they love it, that's great. Uh, I knew Eternal Dynasty was gonna be a hit when I showed it to my friends in the very first playtest. They, they got into an argument <laughs> because they were taking it seriously. Like they were like, you know, every move was calculated, and they actually were like, why did you do that? And so I'm like, hey, you know, they're actually taking. Like it wasn't just a playtest; it actually was a, a game that they were invested in. And I'd say for me too, you notice a difference in comments on your game when people play test it. So it starts with like, I wasn't happy playing this; it didn't feel balanced. I got screwed. Like, like people are really upset emotionally about how things worked in it. I wasn't happy how long the game took, or you know, there are a lot of comments like that. By the end, it's like, well, I just got confused by the iconography or, or like graphic design things that aren't, it's not final. They're not going to matter. You know, I didn't like the way this, I mean, it's all superficial. When it, it goes from gameplay to like superficial changes, um, you know, why don't you change it from a barbarian to a gladiator? So, like, you know, it's, it's all little things that don't affect the gameplay. That's when you know the gameplay is ready, actually. I see that a lot. It starts with a lot of comments on the gameplay, and then they kind of, like, people look for things to comment on, and it's really not a lot there. It's all just on the art or the layout of the icons, which you're going to change anyway because, you know, it's a playtest. Um, and so that's usually when I gauge it as the comments change. Sorry, so a few other questions. Um, so I came late to my class, but I was actually going to ask about art. And you I was I so later. <laughs> but when do you usually involve getting artwork? Um, when do you, like, so that, you mentioned wanting at least the box cover and like, yep. the cards. So yeah, by the time you're going to Kickstarter, you should, yeah. Kickstarter and then, yes. Okay, now we're funded, then the art? Uh, well, I mean, it depends on uh, personal situation, right? Um, like, if, if you're fortunate, you can pay for, early, um, you know, at least... 60% of the art that you can show off, right, including the box cover. Uh, you know, and it depends on how established the artist is, too. Some people, I mean, very few artists, and you shouldn't ask an artist to work on spec, right? Uh, you should pay them for, for their time and, and their effort. Uh, obviously, you may not be able to afford that uh, as a student. Uh, I remember being a student, so <laughs> I couldn't afford anything. Uh, so it, it's very different. And uh, But, like, I know Dan and I are kind of at the phase now, like, for Fancy Tactics. Like, Fancy Tactics is probably... I don't know, several months away from uh, thinking about Kickstarter, but I already started contacting artists because I know I'm going to follow through with this. Like, I know the concept is good, uh, and, you know, we're going to pursue it. So I actually started contracting artists already. Yeah, I mean, for my game, I'm launching in three months or so. Yeah, I started in November with the artist, and uh, we just completed up last month, uh, last week, really. She And she did something new for me yesterday, so we completed yesterday. Um, but... 
because uh, marketing, I mean, I started sharing pictures online a couple of weeks ago because you want people excited about your campaign ahead of time. So having new art every week to share with people, I mean, really drives people, you know, gets their excitement going for your campaign. So I, for this one, I'm having everything done. Like, I mean, it's done now and the campaign is months away and that's because I'm going to use it to market it. Um, and remember too, illustrators are the first step of it and then graphic design is the second step of it. And they're usually not the same person and most illustrators don't do graphic design. But I mean, if you're really good at it, you can do it yourself, but there's like a really special art to doing board game design to the way it flows with gameplay. And so you're going to have to hire a board game a graphic designer as well. And that's more money. And it's just, it's a money pit, but it's worth it because your game's going to do a lot better if you have it all done than if you don't. Yeah. Um, so say all card games, they have 150 cards that are just going to need different art. Or how many different people? Say I need 150 different pieces of art. How many arts would you recommend working with and how long would that would take? I mean, like... Are you talking about like a card game, like CCG kind of, or even like an enclosed card game? I mean, you're probably on a stable of artists. Oh, because if you have one artist doing 150 pieces, that's going to take forever. You're, you're, you know, next year, you're still going to be waiting on, on art. So, I mean, you're probably looking at maybe 150 cards. I mean, it depends on how quick you want to do it, but let's say you give the, if you do five artists and they each have 30 cards, you know, I think that's reasonable. And then you also don't have to contract that many people. I mean, you go the other way and do 30 artists, five cards a piece, uh, but then... You know, it, how much networking do you want to do? How much hiring do you want to do, right? Uh, so there, there's that balance. Uh, and also, you're, you're probably paying uh, a set fee rather than for a card. Yeah, and you could probably get a deal if you're getting it. Exactly. With, with that pieces. much, that's, that's the other thing, too, with ordering a lot of pieces with, with one artist. Like, you know, their set rate is a $100 commission, right? Uh, but if you buy, you know, 30 pieces from someone, you're probably not paying that full 100 Yeah, and just a note on that, um, because it's the same thing with uh, video games. If you have... Multiple artists, um, how do you get those files from them together? Yeah, that's an important one, too. So, a few artists might be better in that sense. Yep. Yeah. Okay. yeah, like each artist draws a specific type of card, right? This artist does character cards, this one does the events, this one does yep. the locations, yeah. And I've done that, too, where I've had cards where, or I've had artists who just get busy and they can't finish a project necessarily. And so they'll do parts of it for me, and then I'll, I'll give them set things that need to go together, and like you said, different card types or things. I have other artists that I know do similar styles that I can work yeah. with. Yeah, Dan actually did that for his Game Gadgeteer. It's like one of his artists only did some of the art, in the, but he found someone who could mimic that style really well. I didn't even know. I'm like, oh, this is a different person. Yeah. And then actually my other game recently, too, I had another uh, an expansion for a game, and the original right. artist couldn't do it. And I found an artist who had a very similar style. And I was like, hey, can you copy this? And he did it, and we worked together, and we made it work. So. But there's only one of my like, contract Yes. Um, how often have you had it? I like to I like to do a little more back and forth uh, because uh, I changed a couple of the abilities in here. But again, it's a superhero game. Like because the artist came back or something. Cool. I'm like, oh, you know what? That guy can fly now, right? <laughs> so yeah, uh, you know, if they do something cool, then uh, yeah, I mean that that can absolutely influence it, uh, and that's why uh, I feel like you should never be totally tied down to. Your ideas, like you should, always, it should always yeah. be fluid. It should always be evolving. Yeah, I'm actually the same exact way. I'm not even going to add to it because that was pretty perfect. So if you guys were, if you're ready to go book for Mars, where would you guys typically go to find? Well, Dan is pretty connected in board game industry, so he like just knows people. I don't. So I go to like a board, like those websites. That's not true. It's, it's pretty true. Well, so no, I mean you just. So I play a lot of board games too, right? Obviously, I mean you got to know what you're doing. So I play a lot of games to learn about them. But when I play a game with great art or art I want to use, I always take note of who the artist is, and then I follow them on Twitter. I have actually a Twitter like a, what do they call list? That's just a private list of mine. That's artists I like. It's called. And whenever I find a board game artist I like, I just throw them in there and. Um, basically when I need an artist, I go back to that feed and I'm like, which one does it, you know, that style art I'm looking for. And I do it that way because I mean, I just follow a lot of artists cause I, I like looking at it too. And then I just, when I'm ready, I'm like, who, you know, <laughs> who yeah. have I collected that I can pick from? Yeah. Like, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm the complete opposite. Like I'll go to upwork.com and I'll post a job posting and like, this, I'm looking for a superhero art. Um, you know, this is the price per piece or, you know, total contract and then they'll come to you. So yeah. assuming your, your posting is attractive enough. Yeah, and for my latest one, there's like this board game artist I've always wanted to use, and I was always connected with her online. 
and she does like children's literature and uh, fairy tale style art that's very colorful and beautiful. And I've always wanted to work with her. And then there was this designer I've talked to a lot who's uh, really great, and he's always wanted to work with her too. And then so my next game is with him. And we had a different theme, and we're like, why don't we make this fairy tale theme to go with this artist's art? And so then we actually made it. It's a Peter Pan themed game, and we contacted her, and she was stoked to do it. And so we were excited to finally work with her. And so kind of I knew about her, and I kind of tailored a game to get a project that we could all work on together. And so and it's worked out great actually, and it's come along. Really Organic. Nice. There you go. Right, and it's just yeah. Just doing it for a long time, talking to these people for years. I mean, these are people I've been talking to. Again, all of these are always like people I talk to for two, three years, and then finally it's like, we have a project we can do together. This is great. And so, yeah, it's never usually immediate. Sorry, I saw a few other hands. No? Are we done? No. How many projects do you typically work on at Harry Dan, I know, juggles a lot. I, I stick to one or two. Any more of my work would kill me. So. Though, though I will say, I have a lot going on, but usually I focus on one once I'm ready. Like, once I'm ready, like, so this one, once I knew I was kickstarting this one, really as of November, it's like all I did. And I spend a lot of time on it. And then you get downtime, and there are times where, you know, there's not a lot going on that day or that week. And so that's when I have my other side projects I can pull in and work on. But once I'm like ready to go, I drop everything else. Cause like, I mean, you really can't design five things at once the whole time. And, bring them to fruition. So at some point you have to pick which is the best, which works, which do I want to run with the most or that I'm most excited about. And I just kind of, you know, make little subfolders in my flash drive of like, okay, when I come back, I need to find these games again. And I just go on the one and I forget about everything else because I need to dedicate like literally all my time to it. I think once you have a routine though, like if you're doing this full time or uh, a moderate amount of time, you can, you know, everything's in a pipe. Okay. Finish design, hire artists, you know, that shifts over. Okay. Design a new game. You know, okay, hire yeah. to shift that over while you're looking for printers. So, I mean, each one thing that moves to the next phase, you can start a new project on the pipe. So, but I mean, that that's very ambitious. Yeah, I do that for about two games a year. So I try and kickstart two games a year. Last year I was going to try and do three, and then I just, <laughs> I did two. And then this year I thought about doing three, and I'm doing two just because I really wanted to focus on this one for May, and I couldn't launch it earlier, and I don't think I can squeeze two more in this year uh, just for, again, having time to focus on it. Um, but I, I always do that. Like he said, have something in the pipeline. As soon as this campaign ends, I usually know what's going to be next that I'm going to work on. And then I just take that one full force and I go with it. Yeah. Are there any of your games that you have wanted to, uh, make patch for? Like, yeah, I did a mini expansion for one, I guess, because like, <laughs> it'd be, it was, it's a two player game because I started off like my, my first game, I wanted to be reasonable, like I can set a low goal. I can just make sure it's card game, it's cheap to print. And then I'm like, you know what? I really like the risk to be four players. Well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> obviously there's no day one DLC for, for board games. But um, there are also, um, if you did like a print and play type game or a, a roll and write, which are those kind of games that are cashing on, yeah, I mean, you absolutely could. You'd be like, okay, here's a PDF, have fun, guys. Um, yeah, yeah and, my and, first game was, uh, it's not great. And uh, so basically I went to grad school and I got my uh, PhD at the U of R and it was like this you know, when you deal with your PI and it's this miserable experience, everyone was unhappy. So I wanted to make a game that reflected that, that kind of like was based on the cynical aspects of going to grad school. And I did. And that was my first campaign I funded. And I just think it could have done so well because there's a huge community like of grad students who feel the same way. And I just didn't, I didn't do the art early enough. The gameplay is just like, uh, it's not great. And uh, I didn't market it well. And like, if I think if I did it now, I could kill with that game and it would do really well. And I've thought about it. I've thought about doing a second edition, modifying all the things that suck in the gameplay. I have all the art done now, you know, because I got the money from the Kickstarter and paid for it and just relaunching it as like a second edition and get rid of the cards that really ruin the game and add it. Like I have ideas and I actually have a list of all the things I want to change. I just haven't had time to do it. And it's like now I'm like really into the hobby board games and to take time away from more of those to like do this kind of niche side project. It's just, Time. If I if I quit my day job and did this full time, I probably would. Like that would be another project I would throw in the mix. But I'm not there yet. But uh, yeah, but I mean that's a great point. Your board game has to be much more polished. Like uh, like if multiplayer is broken when it launches, multiplayer is broken for that game forever. Right? Yeah. Stuff. Yeah. yeah. And also, if anyone has, I brought some cards. So like I'm on Twitter and oh no, I I changed. But I'm on Twitter, Facebook, uh, Gmail. <laughs> I I and uh. 
I'm very easy to, to contact online and I okay. I respond to everything like that day on any platform. So so find me and uh, be sure to, to ask anything or just connect on Twitter and say hi and stuff. Like I love just talking and yeah. hanging out. I'll, I'll post this online too for the group yeah. too. Like oh. mine is here. But I just post pictures of my kids and food. So <laughs> sometimes I'll talk about a, a game and about things. But yeah, and so yeah, yeah. So connect with me any way you can, and I'm happy to talk more. Or even now, if after this it clears up and you want to talk more, let me know. Right. Well, we talked for about board games for two hours. So. Thanks, so sorry yeah, I was thanks. late. I really feel bad about that. Some of us talked for about board games. I, I talked for like 20 minutes. So. No, you're here. You're here for a little while. Uh, rock Game Fest is having a... Oh, do I right click quick? Or? Yeah, it's, so check out the Rock... I don't want yep, to. Yep, it's okay. Okay, yeah. I got it. Thanks. Uh,